Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to Vlog 88. How to be a professor. This is a quirky, weird, and quite fabulous vlog that comes via request. I would never have thought to do this vlog. And the request comes from a dear friend of the Office of Graduate Research, a wonderful student at Flinders University, Todd. Todd is in the first year of his program, and he requested this vlog, How to Be a Professor, in the second week of his candidature. Amazing, and needless to say, my ambitions have never actually been that lofty. But then when I was thinking, actually preparing this vlog for Todd this week, I suddenly realized I've held five professorial jobs in three different countries. And can I say nobody's more surprised than me. But let's not talk about me, let's talk about you. How you, yes you, if this is a thing, a vibe, an ambition for you, how you can become a professor. Now the first thing I need to say to you is the caveat, and it's a significant one. Between 40 and 50% of people right now who do a PhD do stay in universities. But that means 50 to 60% of people who do a PhD leave universities and go into incredibly diverse and fabulous careers. So it is very important to recognise that you know there are many jobs that are available for you, but Todd did want me to focus particularly on the notion of the professor, so the big job that you can get within higher education. So here we go. And in many ways I do understand why Todd was interested in this particular topic, because it does have an aura to it, a professor. Wow, it has an aura to it, and that aura comes particularly from popular culture and from literature, I think. And we have all these cliches that exist in our culture, derived particularly from the 20th century, so that 1961 film, The Absent-Minded Professor, great film, can I say, The Legendary Professor Calculus, from Tintin, yeah, that's fantastic. And of course, professors have also been, much to my amusement, Bond villains, and I think Diamonds Are Forever, great film. And of course, my personal favorite, Professor Moriarty against the truly heroic Sherlock Holmes. I, of course, always preferred Moriarty. I'm like that. Then, of course, we have Henry Higgins, Professor Henry Higgins, from George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, that went on to be My Fair Lady, with the role played by the legendary Rex Harrison. Now, you knew we'd also go there, of course, there are all the professors in the Hogwarts suite, whether we're dealing with Dumbledore, whether we're dealing with the legendary Snape, rock on. And I'll finish off this popular cultural bit with two of my personal favorites. Of course, Indiana Jones, was the Professor of Archaeology, and a big hi to all our wonderful archaeology students, you are amazing. And of course, I had a bit of a crush on him, I did, uh, the Professor from Gilligan's Island. And do we actually know, did he have any other names? I'm not really sure, but he was the Professor from Gilligan's Island, and all the ladies liked him a lot. So from this popular cultural narrative, we've got a series of ideologies and archetypes about the professor that sort of resonate a bit because the professor is clever, sometimes evil, <laughs> pretty pretentious, and also pretty well domina dominated by men. And we're going to come back to that shortly. So, so much for popular culture, that's terrific. Let's talk about our universities. And let's start with some definitions. And the first thing I need to say to you is even though we use the same word, professor, the word professor means different things as you move around the world. So internationally, it does have distinct meanings. But what we do know is the professor is an academic rank. It is also the highest academic rank that you can attain. There's sometimes some adjectives that are put in front of it, like assistant and associate, so assistant professor, associate professor. Again, those words have particular meanings that are different depending on the system that you are in. But in the North American system in particular, it is linked to tenure and the tenure track. So what does hold the professorial group together around the world? Well, they hold a terminal degree. That's not like you're dying, although it does feel like it when you're doing a PhD. But when you are doing a PhD or the other mode of doctorate, that's called a terminal degree, and professors hold one of those. They also teach. 
but their teaching tends to be skewed to upper undergraduate and graduate levels. They also have leadership roles in graduate education, like I do, but also, of course, a lot of guys and gals do a lot of PhD and master's supervision while they are a professor. And often they also hold senior administrative management and leadership roles in a university. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, many universities have what's called a revolving departmental chair. So you're head of department and the professors revolve around those roles. So most professors, one would hope, do some leadership and service for the university at quite a high level. The professor, though, interestingly, has quite a long history. Some of the earliest references to it I have found are from the 14th century, and it is linked with somebody who holds expertise in a particular area, even before the word discipline, like academic discipline existed. Someone who had expertise in something was often called a professor. And of course, it's linked with the verb to profess, that is, to communicate knowledge. Fascinating. So right now, and this is a generalisation, but right now there are two sort of camps on this planet about that have different definitions, if you will, about how the professorial title is used. And so the North American model, the States and Canada, has one particular iteration of the professor, and the former Commonwealth nations and Northern European nations have another. And the African nations, the Asian nations, often fall somewhere in between those two systems. So in both these modes, the professor is the highest rank that you can hold as an academic, but a greater percentage of the academic workforce in Canada and the United States are professors. So you find the title professor much more frequently used in the United States and Canada. So how do you, yes you, become a professor? Well, there are two ways. Firstly, you can be internally promoted through your university. And the second way is you can apply for a job and get the title and the role in that way. Both are quite challenging and difficult. Both have different strengths and weaknesses, but they're the two ways you become a professor. But the title, and again, I'm going to be really honest in this vlog, as I always try and be, but there is no doubt that the title of professor is granted to someone who is is an outstanding researcher. Now, stuff exists about, oh, look, if you're a great teacher, and uh, you can be a professor. Look, maybe, but to be absolutely brutally honest with you, and you know I've committed to teaching my entire life. I've been teaching first-year students since 1994, so I believe in teaching, I commit to teaching. Teaching really, really matters. Having said that, if you want to be promoted, if you want to be a professor, you will be promoted on the basis of your research and you will gain that professorial title on the basis of your research. So in Australia the academic environment is organised in a really interesting way. There are five stages, if you will, of an academic career. A level A academic is an associate lecturer, level B is a B level lecturer, C is a senior lecturer, D is an associate professor, and E is a full professor. And for my North American friends that are watching this vlog, you'll see there is no relationship with tenure with those rankings. So you could be a professor and on a contract, you could be an A-level academic and tenured. So there's no relationship between the title professor and tenure. In the Australian system, salaries go up each stage that you move through the system. And the key difference between the associate professor role and the professor role I think revolves around service to the university. So if you have an international profile in your research that we'll talk about in a second, you'll have a tendency to be promoted to a professor. But if you've made a contribution to your university, then that is, or indeed the sector, or indeed the discipline, then that's another way you become a professor. So as you can see, this is not simply a question of ability. You also have to be lucky, and we're going to talk about in a second how to enhance the possibilities and the potential of that luck for you. But I do have to, again, be honest with you. There is a major problem, a gender problem, 
in Australian universities, particularly with regard to professorships. And the problem is so bad, I couldn't pretend it didn't exist and just sort of go, oh, look, I won't really mention that in the vlog. The problem is so serious, I do need to talk about it. And it started to be revealed uh, from 2012. There was a really powerful paper by Strachan et al. in the Hertzter conference, again, 2012, so a long time ago. And that paper showed from doing some fantastic research that only 20%, 20, 20 percent of professors in Australia are women. And what makes that figure so odd is that 30 percent of DVCs, Deputy Vice Chancellors, are women. So there's actually by proportion more DVCs that are women than professors. Still low, but 20 percent professors. And of course what that means is men increase in their proportion as they move from A through to E. So more men proliferate and dominate each of the categories as they progress up. At Flinders University right now, 27% of professors are women, and the universities with the lowest and the highest percentage of female professors you probably should know about. So Central Queensland University, I used to work, Central Queensland University has 9.1% of its professors that are women, 9.1. And the Australian Catholic University has the highest with 41% of its professors being women. So that's just something for you to consider if you are a woman or you're, you've got mates who are women who are thinking this is a career trajectory. We do have to acknowledge it's a lot harder in Australia to become a professor, okay? And let's hope from my generation to your generation, we start to fix this problem. The question also is how you can become a professor. You know, I know it seems a long way away. How can you actually get there? And the reason why it seems so aloof and so disconnected from daily life is because it is not, it is not the natural trajectory for academics to complete their career as a professor. This is important. If you're a great researcher and a great teacher, you're a great person, great academic, then you will finish your career as a senior lecturer or as a principal lecturer in the British system. So that means if you are great at what you do, you are good at what you do, you will be promoted to a senior lecturer. That is the natural trajectory through which we think about an academic career. And indeed some of the best teachers, some of the best researchers that I know actually never got promoted above senior lecturer. So as you can see, this is not a question of ability alone. Ability, talent, intelligence, crucial, important. But you also have to be lucky. You do, you have to be lucky, and you also have to make your own luck. And you do that by applying for an array of posts. So apply for a lot of different jobs, and the chances are you'll get one. But also, again important, you've got to be prepared to work anywhere in the world if you want to be a professor. No one, not me, not your, your lowly dean, no one can promise you that you can be a professor. No one can say if you work hard you'll be a professor. That's simply not the case because it's not the natural end point of an academic career. A senior lectureship is. And as I said, you do have to be lucky. But I wanted to finish this vlog today with five quick tips whereby you can enhance your luck. You've got a chance of actually making it if an opportunity comes your way that you can take it. So here are the five truths I've learned through my career and the research demonstrates about how you can become a professor. And again, I'm not gonna pull any punches here. I'm gonna be clear. One, stay research active every day, every week, every month, every year of your career. No excuses, none, no excuses. So no matter what your teaching load, stay research active. If you don't, that admits weakness and the chances are you will not become a professor. I'm dead serious on this one. Now, no excuses, really important, oh, teaching load. I've taught 10 courses a year, guys, no excuses. I've never had a sabbatical, I've never had a research leave. You know what, you just get up early and you get on with it. You get on with it, and if you don't, then you're not research active and then you're actually chasing your tail to try and remain in work, let alone try and be promoted. So keep researching, keep writing, keep your CV absolutely up to date. Two, say yes a lot. 
now, particularly in the first 10 years of your career, so you right now, you need to build your CV. You need to find as many options and opportunities as possible to show your wares, to add lines to your CV. In teaching, absolutely. In research, absolutely. But also in service, you're going to need to demonstrate a commitment to the higher education sector within your institution, but also beyond it if you can find ways to commit to service. And just to give you an example of it, when I was 28, so that's 20 years ago, oh my goodness, uh, when I was 28, I had two things happen to me. I was a B-level academic, so a really lowly level B-level academic, and I got an opportunity to be the program chair of cultural studies, which then was one of the great cultural studies programs in the world, can I say. Sadly, no more. But no one else wanted that job, so they sort of ended up with this incredibly young woman, would you be program chair? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. And Right now, I'm the Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University, 20 years later. What I would also say too, in that same year when I was 28, I was asked to be the faculty representative on the university's research high degree committee. So to represent the students, the supervisors, do the scholarships, do the milestones, write policy for research high degrees at Flinders as a 28 year old woman. I had fantastic mentoring from the then Dean, Frank Murray, big love to Frank, wonderful human being. So at 28, I took on two chances, two opportunities that probably shouldn't have been presented to me and I was terrified. I won't remotely clean this up for you. I was in bed at night going, can I do this? I don't know if I have the ability to do this, but I said yes and I had a go and I've had five professorships since then, but right now, today, 20 years later, I'm the Dean of Graduate Research and the Professor of Cultural Studies. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't taken those chances when I was 28 as a B-level academic. Three, H huge one, huge one, huge one. International is everything. Boom. The difference between an associate professor and a professor is your international standing. So local standing, great. National standing, great. But every single time you have an opportunity to move beyond Australia and do something, write, research, do a conference, do a keynote, every single time you have an opportunity to arch beyond Australia, you do that. And that's the difference between an ASPRO, an associate professor, and a professor. Four, apply for everything. Apply for everything. Getting work is really hard. Getting work while trying to be promoted at the same time is even harder. The difference, guys, is one's called a horizontal appointment. So you're a senior lecturer and you move to another university as a senior lecturer. That's easier. The hardest appointments are always when you're at a particular level, like a B level, and you're trying to get to a C or a senior lecturer. That's called a vertical promotion. Very hard to do, but when you get them, it's fantastic. And the other problem we've got, and it's a big one, is about 40% of academic jobs that are advertised are already filled, and we all know that. The problem is you never know which 40%. There are certain universities that I will never apply for because I know it's tight as a drum, and actually they're not really jobs. So, so those particular universities we all know, we never talk about it, but we all know, and we never bother applying there. But you know, one would hope most of the time, 60% of the time, the jobs are actually available for you. So the key is, when you're thinking, I'm trying to get promoted, you need to apply for every single job at the level that you want to attain. And once you start to get those posts, then you can make a choice. And what I want for all of you is that choice. So apply for everything, get two or three of those jobs, assess them, and then work out which one is the best for you and your family and your friends at this point of your career. Five, take risks, take risks. Now, I am not a risk taker. Then you look at my life and you go, yeah, you are. But I'm really not a risk taker. But if you are going to be a professor, you are going to have to move outside of your comfort zone. You're gonna to have to move outside of your experiences, outside what you know, even outside what your supervisors know. Because the one truth I can tell you is the higher education sector right now 
is tougher and more ruthless than it has ever been. So if you've got supervisors and friends who have been at the, in the same job for 10 or 15 or 20 years, then they're probably not going to be able to help you much because the environment you're going to go into of gig economies and portfolio careers and a series of contracts, adjunct professorships, which we we'll might talk about in another vlog, that's your environment. So you're going to have to take risks to get out of that temporary transitory workforce. So you're going to have to take chances. Now, when I think about most of the jobs that I took in the first 10 years, 15 years of my career, I just want to say to you I was terrified a lot of the time. So the, the first series of jobs I took for the first 10, 15 years, I used to lay in bed at night. And my first job when I went to Wellington, didn't know a soul, year contract, hardest work I've ever done. And when I arrived in Wellington to this freezing cold house, I sobbed my guts out in bed. And I just thought, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And you know what? Woke up the next morning, had a shower, and I did it. And that's the nature of the first 10 years of your career. You've got to back yourself. You're going to feel like, I just can't do this. It's just too big. I just can't do this. Back yourself. You can do it. And keep moving. If you want to be the best, if you want to be a professor, then you're going to have to move beyond the normal, the acceptable and the familiar. You're going to have to be extraordinary. And yeah, you're going to have to be lucky. And I really look forward to seeing Todd's career over the next subsequent decades. Todd, you're a fantastic human being, great suggestion, would never have thought of this one without you. And I hope it has been useful and you are a great scholar and I wish you well in your career and I wish you all well in your career. From beautiful Flinders University, quite quiet isn't it, quite beautiful this morning, but I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.